hello and welcome to Sharon Local History. In this video I would like to tell you more about streetcars and Sharon. Um, we will talk about a period of pretty short period of about 20 years from 1900s to 1920s. Um, I use images that uh, were collected by members of Sharon Historical Society and uh, I am also using maybe half of the images are from um, Sharon Library, Digital Commonwealth, and they are just stock images to kind of give you a feel for the period. This is the most famous image of um, streetcar in Sharon. It's actually center of town. On the right side you see Quaker Inn, where the bank is now, and on the left side was um, Petit's Market, where Sharon Market is now. So you're looking down south from the center of town. About 1900, a streetcar line was built from Cobb's Corner to the corner of Garden Street and East Foxborough Street by Norfolk and Bristol Street Railway, which purchased Bookhards Grove on the lake. The line connected at Cobb's Corner with cars of for Stoughton, which connected with lines covering most towns on, on the South Shore. Another line ran from Cobb's Corner to Boston with a branch line to Norwood, which in turn connected with lines uh, to most inland towns. By the way, when you research the ownership, um, it becomes a little bit complicated. You will hear three different names. Um, I will try to make it a little bit clearer. So the Norwood Canton and Sharon Street Railway was incorporated on March 15, 1900 to build from Norwood to Canton and from Cobbs Corner, East Sharon to Sharon, Sharon Heights and Lake Massapoa. Four months later, the Blue Hills Street Railway, you will hear that name a lot, was given permission to build from Canton to Norwood. The matter rested until 1901, when the two companies settled on a compromise, providing for a connection at the Neponset River Bridge, at the operation of through service between the two communities. Operation of the 4.7-mile Canton Norwood Line commenced on or about um, Mar May 17, 1901, with Blue Hills conductors and motormen operating the line as the line on the east side was owned by the Blue Hills and the section into Norwood owned by the Norwood, Canton and Sharon, they, reach, they each received half pay from each company. The crew was supposed to change their hats, badges when operating on each of the two roads. A few months later, in September 1901, the Norwood, Canton and Sharon opened a three-mile route from Cobbs Corner to Lake Massapoa the line stopping at the near corner of Garden Street. There was a two-track car barn on North Main Street near the pond beyond Sharon Box Company. Power was purchased from the Blue Hills Street Railway Powerhouse at Springdale near the pond on Bolivar Street. Norwood, Canton and Sharon was an independent small trolley line and Dr. William O. Faxon, a well-known doctor of Stoughton, was one of the directors. The road owned about five or six cars and could borrow cars from Blue Hills Street Railway whenever they needed extra equipment. They owned two four-wheel RR roof closed cars and one four-wheel ten bench and one eight-wheel number nine car. They also had a snowplow. I couldn't find any images of the snowplow that it was used for the streetcars, but here is image of people chipping in in Quincy and cleaning up the snow from the tracks. The track was on the right-hand side of Main Street until it reached Glendale Road, at which point it followed the center of the road through the square and returned to the side of the road, um, and then it continued to Peck's Corner, where is East Foxborough, it turned on its Foxborough to the corner of Garden Street, which was the end of the line. The rails and ties were embedded in the ground, so that only the top of the rails was visible. The power came from a single overhead wire and was transmitted by a trolley to the electronic motor which drove the car. The cars were quite small, seating about 25 
or 30 people. The car had one set of trucks which had four wheels very close together and the electric motor was built into the trunks. The body of the car was mounted on the trucks with doors and controls at each end of the car. Instead of turning the car around at the end of the line, the trolley pole was mounted on a pivot in the center of the roof and had a line attached near the trolley wheel and it would be swung around to the opposite end of the car. The motorman would light, take his handles to the other end and proceed in the other direction for the return run. The first man in the morning left Cobb's Corner at 6.15 and left Sharon Heights at 6.45. This schedule was maintained every hour until the last car arrived at Cobb's Corner at 11.15 at night. Barney McGuire was the day conductor and Pat Donahue was the motorman. Tim O'Donnell was the night motorman and Ralph Crocker was the conductor. Barney and Ralph came from Sharon, Tim and Pat from Canton. The conductor collected the fares and the motorman operated the controls. The car barn was located across the street from the pond on North Main Street and contained space cars and maintenance car equipped with a snowplow. Long before Sharon plowed the streets, this plow cleared the tracks after a storm. During the day, the power in the barn was shut off, and when the operating car came back from the last trip at night, the conductor would reach it through a small door and put on the switch to supply power to the car away. One night, the switch was put on, and the conductor turned to open the large doors to, the, to let the car in. One of the cars inside burst through the doors and took off with no lights for Sharon Heights. The conductor tried to pull off the switch before it reached the main line, but all in vain. It reached the main power and kept going. The crew started after it with the other car, but both had equal speed. The runaway never was caught. It ran off the end of the line and smashed into a large oak tree on the corner of Garden Street. Subsequently, the tree died from the blow. Joe Poirier was just arriving back from a round trip to Boston with his horses and wagon when he heard the first car coming and pulled over to the side of the road. It had room to pass, but he didn't see it go by because it did not have any lights. Then he heard the second car coming and saw it pass. He continued on home, much confused with the sudden traffic in the streets, cars in Sharon. During the summer months, open cars were used. They had no sides except the bar, which the conductor raised and lowered to allow access to the seats. The conductor walked along a catwalk outside the car, gripping the handholds while collecting fares, ringing them up, ringing bells to stop and start, while the car dashed along at 15 miles per hour and his coattails blew in the wind. On a summer day, Helen Bowman dropped her teddy bear out of an open car and began to howl, whereupon conductor McGuire ran for the car to stop, retrieve the toy and return it to its grateful owner. Several times during the summer, 8 to 12 large open cars arrived from Boston for picnics at Burkhardt's Grove. They took up most of the tracks on East Foxboro Street. When it came time to return, the cars had to leave 10 minutes apart, otherwise the power drain would be so great none of them could move. If you want to learn more about the Grove, we made separate video. Eventually, Traffic became so light it did not pay to continue running streetcars, although the town subsidized the last year of operation. The wires and rails were removed and so ended another era. A couple of years later, the car barn burned and no vestige was left of the trolley line except a few old ties left in the ground which created bumps. The ties were removed later.
Thank you for watching Sharon Local History. I will make part two because I have more details about um, how Sharon resident wanted to keep the streetcars in Sharon and the struggles. Thank you for watching and uh, tune out for part two.